Patrick, welcome to the Z Learning Podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, Zev. Thanks very much for having me. My pleasure. So, Patrick, tell us about what you do as a voiceover actor and to what kind of companies or organizations do you usually lend your voice? I do quite a wide variety of stuff. I do um, commercial work for TV and radio. I do telephone IVR on hold stuff. Uh, Internet explainer videos, quite a bit of that. Um, And uh, companies like Ford Motors, Labatt Blue, um, Fujitsu. I did a laptop thing for them. Collier Real Estate. I do some, sometimes I do these voiceovers for real estate when you see the the overhead cameras and stuff and they're they're advertising a property. Um, uh, What else? And then uh, the last year or so, I've done quite a bit of e-learning work. Um, One company I work for is a company out of Vancouver, BC called Kilo and um, other companies too. And I've done stuff for them like uh, uh, job safety and uh, team building, team excellence, diversity and inclusion and instructional stuff, uh, that kind of thing. Cool. So on the e-learning side, let's go a little more, let's dig a little more into that. Um, You said you do voiceovers for explainer videos, uh, diversity and inclusion trainings. So maybe we could go, maybe give us some examples. Um, You know, do you do a lot of, said you do trainings, workplace policy, safety. Mm -hmm. Um, Is it like videos like, um, you know, how to use this piece of equipment without, you know, killing yourself or, uh, you know, our workplace sexual harassment policies, or is it like, um, you know, uh, have you heard this uh, being said in your office? This is something that you should report. Like what kind of, um, or is it like how to use this software? Um, Is it mostly workplace stuff? A lot of that. Yeah. And in fact, almost everything you listed is stuff that I've worked on. Um, A cool one I did a while back was for Caterpillar, you know, the machine company, they make the backhoes and stuff. Mm -hmm. They have, I guess, probably for the last 10, 15 years, they have, they have a line of machines that are remotely operated. So the operator's in a booth somewhere and the machine's out in the, in the field doing the work, which is obviously a nice, safe environment for the operator. So I did this long e-learning thing as far as just instructional instruction on, for the operators and safety for that, because there's still safety issues, even though they're not in, in the actual machine. And that was really interesting. Um, Sometimes you get medical stuff, which is, there's a lot of dense terminology. You have to go reference Merriam-Webster online or YouTube for proper pronunciations of words you've never heard before. So that's really interesting. And uh, it's, you know, very, like I say, very dense. Um, And just like what you said before, uh, proper behavior in the office and stuff like that and team building, that that whole corporate narrative sort of thing. So that keeps you busy. Wow. So, um, you know, I imagine there's been a lot of growth in demand for these kind of things. Um, as of this recording, we're still, you know, in the whole uh, pandemic thing. And I'm sure there are a lot more remote trainings and um, things like that. I'm wondering, you know, when someone's hearing your voice, are they usually watching a video and they're with actors or an animation or, you know, in what form does your voice do people usually consume your voice over work? yeah like that like traditional powerpoint stuff with slides going by in my voice or like sometimes well i'm not usually syncing or voicing to an actor uh there might be like a uh what you call an avatar or a sort of a an animated guy and i'm uh voicing for him uh that goes on and then uh sometimes just yeah, it's just like you say it's what you think with the pandemic uh, this is just getting bigger and bigger because people are just everything's happening remotely. Um, I've even done English courses like ESL courses, uh, just basic English, and those were there was a ton of work there. Um, so yeah, uh, that kind of thing. Cool. And how did you get into voiceover work? And specifically, how did you get into the e-learning space? <laughs> what led you to this niche field? Right. Uh, the voiceover stuff. I mean, I started just like over 10 years ago and, and set up at home and uh, built my studio at home and started auditioning. And then as far as e-learning um, and other work, too, but a lot of the e-learning stuff has come from LinkedIn. And just I learned to build my pro like I 
spent a while building my profile, but I mean, there's always, you can always add to that and change it and update it and add stuff I've worked on, but I've uh, literally met a lot of clients from LinkedIn. I've been approached and I've have approached and uh, it has worked out quite well. And you just have a, a, a direct relationship with, with the client and uh, it's wonderful. Actually, LinkedIn's a, just a great place. LinkedIn's a, a, a great, a great tool. Um, you know, I've been using it for a long time to network. Um, I've gotten referrals and clients for my marketing agency there. And it's true what you say that the increase in demand for e-learning. I mean, when I just put e-learning in my uh, bio as one of the industries that I focus on, because interestingly enough, I was working with ed tech clients. I was writing about the space and working with clients in remote training since 2012. Uh, and I kind of just had an idea and about a year ago that, hey, you know, I think there's going to be more on this. So I mentioned, I highlighted that as one of my niches on LinkedIn. I definitely have gotten uh, interesting inquiries about that. And um, one thing I actually do with clients is help them um, figure out how to optimize their LinkedIn, their profile, their content posting messaging strategy, um, you know, how to use LinkedIn in mail, to get more clients, more leads, and build their presence. Um, so what's a current project you're working on that might be kind of cool? It, obviously, only as much as you can disclose. <laughs> right. Um, well, I'll just mention a couple. I did actually a video sales letter a couple of weeks ago. I'm just going to mention this quickly because it was a little different because I ended up uh, being asked to do some on-camera stuff, which is you know not something I normally do. I prefer to just... Uh, keep my face for radio, as they say, a good face for radio, but mm -hmm. I got asked to do some on camera stuff and that was fun. And, but most of it was voiceover. And then they had me come in and, and do some on camera stuff. Um, currently I've got this one going on, uh, just how to properly, uh, transport dry ice, uh, mm -hmm. and do it safely and do it to code. Um, it's, it's a Canadian one. So it's Canadian code, but it's probably similar to the U S um, so I'm doing that right now. And that's pages and pages of stuff. And uh, yeah, so you just the challenge is to not put the listener to sleep, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, it not be over the top. It's it's different than commercial work, obviously. But uh, yeah, the, the dry ice one is one that's happening right now. That is interesting. And that's one thing I love about the e-learning field and also being in marketing, um, just getting to learn about so many different kind of things that maybe you never even would have thought about or yeah. been exposed to otherwise. And just, you get to learn a little bit about everything. I imagine journalists have a similar experience. It's just, it's really fun and vibrant and you're just always getting to learn new things every day. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and you were saying, um, I actually wanted to ask you about your process a little bit here. You said uh, it's different from commercial work. You wouldn't be like, like me on this podcast, like, welcome to the Z learning podcast. Like, you know, it wouldn't, you, you want to, you you're saying you want to be soothing, right? Like, I mean, you know, you have a soothing voice, but you don't want to put people to sleep, but you also right. don't want to be over the top. Can you right. elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, and a lot of the content's pretty serious and it, like um, just even with this dry ice thing, like people need to do it right. You, you need to explain it right. Keep their attention because mistakes can be costly or there could be, you know, there can be uh, litigations or there can be injuries and deaths. So um, it's, it's just something to take very seriously, but you don't want to sound too serious, especially if it's, if it's, you know, an hour or two hours of content. Um, so there's a, a balance to strike there for sure, as far as that. And it, it's way different than selling beer or, you know, Honda parts and service. Uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, there's a balance to strike and it took me a little while to get to, to get rolling on that, but uh, you, you dig into it and uh, you just move forward. And Very interesting. I, I and found a similar um, experience with copywriting. Like, you know, it's not, it, you don't want to be, um, it's not the same as creative writing or fiction writing, but it's also not like essay writing or academic writing. You have to strike a balance between being informational, but also being interesting, getting people's attention. Um, so I, I kind of uh, relate to what you're saying um, and, and kind of have an idea of what you're talking about. And it's interesting that, um, you know, we always, we always have to, and I, I always teach this with in, in my 
marketing strategy sessions that you always have to consider the context in which mm. uh, the person is is consuming your content. More important than content is the context. And a lot of times, uh, for example, a commercial, um, a piece of uh, edutainment like this podcast, it's often people are choosing to listen or watch it or read it of their own free will, and they're giving you their time and attention. So you've got to really... Um, You've got to really do things to catch their attention and keep it because they don't have to uh, be right. watching. And there's no real, there's not necessarily huge consequences if they don't consume every word. Okay, they may invest some money in the wrong place, the wrong kind of advertising, but you know, it's not the same as, uh, or they might buy a product that's not as quite what they were looking for. However, in you, what you're doing is, you know, if they miss something, you could have what you were just saying, liability, uh, death. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, right. So, right. Uh, it, it, and also most of the people who are consuming it, I imagine probably kind of have to for compliance, right. uh, you know, to advance in their career and um, it's, it's mandatory. So they have to be there, but just because they have to be there doesn't mean there um it should be boring you've got to make a personal connection with the listener so that's right. pretty cool that you're uh you've struck that balance um i see you have a great studio behind you um and tell me a little bit uh when you get a script or a concept do you get any input about the copy uh about the creative like what happens in the video or mm. um, like, do you ever say, Hey, you know, this word, you know, if we use this, I, I think it's going to throw off the flow. I think that the person who's listening to this might not understand. Or is it like very, like you're, you're more, you're only focused like more on like how to, you know, your voice, like. No, well, I'm always in touch with the client because with, when the material is really dense, you're going to run into things and you want to okay it. Um, <clears throat> quite often you'll make a subtle change and they'll be good. That's great. And sometimes there's just usually these scripts are like completely like thought out and perfect, but sometimes you catch little things and you want to go ahead and, and communicate. I'm always communicating. I'll never just go, you know, wing it on my own, or I might do it and just give them a heads up that I did it this way just to save everybody time. So I don't have to go back and, and redo stuff. So I, I keep my wits about me as far as the flow of it. Because um, you, you want to sound, you want to sound not like you're reading. You want to sound kind of like you're speaking the words itself. You're you're coming from the place of knowledge. But um, as far as changing copy, yeah, anything to do with changes, um, I'm always in touch with the client. It's there's always at least one person I'm going back and forth with for continuity. Yeah, very important in the client uh, service provider relationship to have open lines of communication. It's often mm -hmm. a very collaborative process, and. Um, I know, and being a writer, I know writers can sometimes be touchy about uh, people wanting to change what they're working on. They put a lot of thought into each uh, word. I know that, um, I, I mean, I've watched enough documentaries to know that sometimes there's clashes between writers and actors, uh, like on TV shows and movies. Mm -hmm. um, but that's great that you have, so you have an open line of communication. And how would you say, to your, are your clients receptive when you have, when you give them some feedback or input about the script or about the training video, um, something, you know, that's outside your, uh, the, the voice acting, are they receptive? Do they appreciate it? Yeah. But for the most part, I, I refrain from doing that as long as the copy flows and I'm good. I don't want to act like uh, I know more than them or, or try to affect any changes. It's they've spent, you know, hours, maybe hundreds of hours, developing this copy. And so I'm, I'm not really in a place to, to make any sort of changes, especially with e-learning. It's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty done and solid and, and it's factual stuff that I'm not going to, you know, um, when it comes to other types of voiceovers, maybe, but even then, you know, it's the, the client as I can just assume that they poured over this stuff and put their heart into it. So I'm, I'm really just the voice, but, you know, I approach it that way. Cool. Um, and, you know, just thinking about communication and I know that in all fields, especially with clients, there can be, um, you know, sometimes it can be a game of telephone. Other times it can be very direct, which is great. 
you probably have to work with, um, you know, I don't know who exactly makes the hiring decision. I'm sure some of the companies you work with are big enough to even have an e-learning department head or something, but like, do you have to often coordinate with the instructional designer, the head of um, operations or like human resources, if it's like a um, workplace policy or safety, you know, engineers, because maybe that they, they have to give their input about how the product works or whatever, or, um, it, you know, I'm sure there are the videographer, the designer, how much, um, uh, how would you say it usually goes, or do you usually only work with like one or two people? Just one or two people, uh, maybe the designer or somebody speaking on their behalf. And then sometimes there are directed sessions which happens maybe a little more in commercial work, but where you're actually online with them while you're recording, um, which is fine. You welcome that. Use Source Connect or Skype or just a phone call or FaceTime. Uh, that, that happens fairly often. Um, and then that's a good situation because, you know, by the, at the end of the session, everybody's got what they want because you, sometimes you're going line by line and they're telling you, sort of, they may even give you line reads and I'm all good with that because then I know, I know I'm giving them what they want precisely so you know what's it let's go into your process a little bit is it like an hour do you usually how, how long do you record at a time are these long you said sometimes it could be a half hour so do you do it in like one take do you pause to take a sip of water mm -hmm. how does that go do you have to do you have to gargle or do some exercises before yeah, well, it's like anything where you're sitting at a desk too long. You don't want to sit there for too long. But most of the e-learning e things are split up into modules, right? So I'll do one module will be like one file on my, on my digital audio workstation. I'm using Pro Tools. So sometimes the modules are, it might be a half hour or an hour long of a 10-hour whole thing. And I'll do, I'll record all that. As far as the process, I'll be reading my copy, usually from my iPad and I'll try to go as far as I can one take, but you inevitably always stop or you make some mistakes. Some people have a little clicker to catch their mistakes. So you see the spike on the audio file. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do that, but the, if I make a mistake, I'll just go back and fix it. And then obviously after everything's done on even one 10 minute module, or whatever, I have to go back and edit everything and get out the mouth noises and the breaths. So that's a whole process in and of itself after the recording's done. I usually finish a module recording wise, and then I'll go back and finish the edit on it before I move on to the next module um, and then clean it all up and put that into one file and put it off. And then that's how I'll send them their files. I'll send each module as a separate file. And they're usually pretty specific on how they want that done too. So that's, I guess, the process there. Does that answer you okay? Yeah. Though? So you're yeah. not just doing the voice. You're also doing the sound editing and stuff like that. Yeah. A lot of people uh, farm it out. If I get something that's massive or if I'm that busy, you know, you can hire editors. I'll, you know, I've done that from time to time where it's just, you just don't have the time to do mm -hmm. the editing. So you, you, you know, you farm that stuff out. So if I have to, I'll do that, but I'm used to doing a lot of editing and I'm, I'm pretty quick at it. I used to be, I was a recording engineer for years in, in studios up here in Canada doing music production and uh, uh, back when we were using tape still. And then I went into post-production doing um, ADR, like dialogue replacement on the other side of the glass, recording actors and stuff. I worked on X-Files and Millennium out in Vancouver. Oh. Uh, we, the actors would come in and sometimes they'd have to replace their lines um, because it'd be noise on set and they'd come in and have to look at themselves on TV and speak that in. I'm getting off on a tangent here, but I basically meaning um, I've got a lot of experience in audio and recording, so I'm pretty okay with the editing, but if, it, if it's too much for me time-wise, I'll, I'll, you know, farm it out. That's some cool. Uh, wow. You've, you've been involved in some interesting projects. And, and now if um, let's say an e-learning company, they hire you to do, voice for their uh set of training modules um w how many would you say like obviously i know from uh copywriting and working with videographers and and graphic designers it's usually a set number of revisions um you know sometimes a client may not be the best at communicating what they were looking for or something changes or there's a glitch, you know, how many, like, how does it work with like your revision process? 
Well, um, you just when they 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 get back from me, they get back the modules back, and they obviously pour over them. They listen to them closely, and anything they have, they get they get very specific. And and I've got the copy, and I can zero in on it, and just I'll just go in and fix it in the same file that I sent them, and then just re uh, bounce the file down and send it back to them. So they're pretty specific about changes, and uh, they're usually very clear. And I'll just go in and fix what they need fixed. Awesome. And I apologize if there was, I don't know if you heard it. There's like someone hammering um, next door no. working. Yeah. Wherever. But um, you know, now that's interesting. I know you're in a booth and all of that um, would love to have that eventually. Like I'm sure that you're, you have a process. Like you said, if there's an error or if there's a siren that goes by or a hammer or, you know, someone dropped, something on their foot in the next room, like <laughs> you have like a way of um, screening that out. Yeah. So I'm in a fairly quiet residential area and uh, this room's pretty good, but sirens and uh, there's a dog next door. Sometimes he barks, but he doesn't bark for long. If I'm in the middle of a take and, and that happens, I just stop and wait for the noise to stop. It's usually very temporary. I'm not in a noisy area. Um, construction would be a problem. If I, someone was hammering outside, I just not be able to record um because uh yeah because i this booth isn't completely soundproof for incoming sounds but traffic noise is not an issue where i am and uh yeah i just stop start because it's not like music when you're in the middle of a take of a song uh and you're in this flow of singing or whatever which which i've done too um that's different it's just line by line stuff you can just stop wait for the noise to go away and restart it's not a big deal cool so unless you have <laughs> A uh, soundproof room or studio to use um, might not be the most ideal field to go into if you live in Queens, uh, where I live, or, or Brooklyn, or something. But uh, if well, if you have a, if you can get like a, a, one of a whisper room, they're like five thousand um, dollars. This is a sort of a custom one I built, and it's great. Uh, those whisper rooms you could put inside your place. Um, like I say, they're very expensive, but they will the high end whisper rooms will pretty much block out almost anything. Um, I've had, I've talked to voice actors that have had them and loved them. So I, one of a guy out West, I know had one and he sold it because he found it was just, just too dead of an environment. You need to have it dead, but sometimes it takes off like the higher end frequencies, depending on your voice, your mic, it, there's so many variables. Um, I may, you know, go for one of those whisper rooms at some point, but right now this is doing the trick the way I've customized this room. It's, it's perfect for me. Cool. And now, you know, you've had an interesting career in, um, in, as a sound engineer, editing audio, and now you're working as a voice actor in the e-learning space, working mm -hmm. with clients like Caterpillar, which is really exciting and it's fast growing. So what are your plans going forward? What are your goals? Where do you hope to take your voice over career next? And also, are there any fun dream projects either in the pipeline or just something you think about? Yeah, well, more of the same. Um, I really enjoy the work and the e-learning can be nice and steady, but I, I'd still do very much like to do commercial work, those shorter projects that come in. Those are those are cool because, you know, you can bang them out in an hour or two and and uh, and you're you're one and done sort of thing. Um, I am. a I was a working musician as well for a long time. So <clears throat> I, I I'm a singer songwriter. I write songs. So for fun, I do that and I record that and, and put it out there. I put out an album uh, back about five years ago under the name Died in Blue. It's sort of um, rock sort of stuff. Um, sort of throwback, but not too throwback. So I, I work on that for, for fun cool. music, guitar. I like, I love to play guitar and record and write. Awesome. Maybe we should, we could link that in the show notes too. And, and where could, where can people find you if they want to network, you know, connect with you, maybe inquire about your voice acting services mm -hmm. is LinkedIn the best place or where can people find you? I really do like communicating through LinkedIn. I find it's quick. There's, they say there's 650 million people on there. Um, a lot of my clients are there and the messaging's great. And then if you want to 
um, not bother with their messaging. You just message somebody your email address and you're good to go. Of course, I have a website. It's uh, patrickgrayandvoice.com and you can message me there and, and a lot of my work's there. I need to add, uh, refresh it and add some, some of the later projects I've been doing, the more recent stuff. But yeah, LinkedIn's great and um, all my contact information is on LinkedIn. You can, uh, my email's there if you want to just get it, reach at me, reach out to me that way or the voice or the uh, website. Cool. I'll, I'll put them both in the show notes and uh, yeah, we, we met on LinkedIn. So That's powerful right. tool to get you on podcasts and Patrick, thank you so much for being on the Z learning podcast. It was really a pleasure. I think uh, my listeners learned a lot uh, as did I and really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks. Zevs. Thanks so much. We should do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you.